Our, our final speaker in the whole stretch is Norm Cox. He grew up as an or I yield. He grew up as an organic farmer and branched out into high tech and came back to farming and has all kinds of really interesting perspectives. Great, thanks so much. It's really uh, uh, and he's from New Hampshire. And from New Hampshire, uh, it's a it's a real pleasure to be able to uh, be the last speaker in such a, uh, a fantastic day. Uh, I know I learned a lot, um, so uh, I'm really looking forward to tomorrow. Um, my perspective uh, today uh, is to merge some of uh, my own interests and where uh, and to bring in I think uh, some perspectives uh, from history that I think can show that. Where we're at today has been an ongoing struggle um, and that, uh, that it has yet to be solved in the history of humanity, but we have actually a lot of the tools in place to, uh, to really make some real progress, and I think that's what we're seeing with some of the optimism we're hearing today. So I'm starting my uh, talk today with uh, two slides uh, uh, to sort of highlight that. One is the accumulated knowledge of biodiversity and abundance uh, that is evidenced by this biological system and this uh, radish doing work for us here. And the other is a relatively new force that we have in uh, thinking about agriculture. And this is uh, an image of uh, the internet, which is only 5,000 days old. Um, and it's gonna be doubling in its complexity uh, every two years. So if we're thinking about the tools that we have to deploy on solving some of these issues, I think it's very important to say, how are we going to use these tools? And if we're thinking about uh, systems and regenerative systems, they're fundamentally different than extractive systems. They're not based on a fixed resource base. Uh, it's actually uh, um, uh, a resource base that is dependent on management. Um, and so I would argue that we're uh, working with abundant resources that are knowledge limited. And so then how do we deploy the tools that we have, the seeds, breeds, technology, uh, to best bring those tools together uh, to create uh, abundance for our own purposes? So this is not a new idea. Uh, uh, the uh, physiocrats uh, during the Enlightenment uh, had a metaphor that they used to explain the role in agriculture, and they were the first land-based economists. Uh, they were referenced by Adam Smith in Wealth of Nations, that, and they believed most fundamentally, and they were writing from an agrarian uh, national perspective, that uh, the wealth of nations could only be improved by improving the productivity of the soil. Um, and that because of this uh, model, it was in the national interest to, uh, to improve the, the uh, agriculture. And so part of their approach was that if, if the national interest is, uh, if, and they used this, uh, this metaphor, uh, uh, Francis Kisne especially uh, mentioned this, um, if agriculture is the root of this metaphor of, uh, of the state, population the trunk, arts and commerce are a subset. And they use the concept of resilience uh, in this metaphor that if you have a, uh, a storm that blows the leaves and breaks the branches that can regrow and regenerate. However, if an unfriendly insect were to attack the roots, the entire system withers and dies. And there's a natural balance and relationship and hierarchy to the function of these systems. There was a concerted effort to eliminate this land as a factor of production, not much after that, because that also assumed a certain level of political power when it was associated with land. Um, and so, and this uh, led to this, this notion of fixed external ac extractable inputs, this extractive process um, that's led to where we, where we are. And then the, the, the natural result of that is an atrophied biological regenerative system. Uh, so a small root system with an oversized uh, canopy. And you can see the political power switched. Agriculture is a subset of commerce rather than agriculture is fundamentally different than every other business. And I think from a political perspective, understanding that, that power dynamic is really important. And part of what, when I'm talking about a little later in open source agriculture, how important that is. And how important it is from a, from a perspective when we're engaging in agriculture, that in this perspective, agriculture is a subset, whereas in the agrarian perspective, everybody has an interest Everybody is interested in a food system that they, uh, that's supporting us. And so the logical result, you've seen this before a lot today, and this natural progression of downward spiral of uh, soil as a result of this 
mechanistic viewpoint rather than agrarian viewpoint. Uh, this is uh, an image of our soil, just to, again, we've seen many of these today. Uh, same exact soil type just down the road. 8% organic matter versus 1% organic matter. So we know that it's possible, this variability in inputs, that it's not a fixed input, it's variable, it's variable production rate, is something that we can do. It's well documented. So what are the conditions that we can do that? What are those tool, what's in that toolbox? Well, it's highly complex uh, and it's highly localized. So when I'm looking at, at our farming operation, I'm looking at what are the tools that we have, all this genetic diversity and all these different niches that are being filled. And we have mostly paid attention to this top layer. But as we've also started to, uh, to learn more, we're starting to look at these root structures. And so if we're trying to maximize product, productivity throughout the year and uh, increase the amount of biological work and build that soil, and, uh, and abundance, create abundance through these tools. How do we match all these systems together, the legumes and, and, the, uh, and the grasses and the warm season and the cool season? How do we spread those out uh, to maximum effect and structurally fill those niches from uh, agroforestry uh, to, uh, uh, to other annual and perennial uh, mixtures and rotations? So this is one of the things that we're trying to do on our farm is is even that out as opposed to you know, having one spike of growth, try to have stretch those growing days across species, across uh, annuals and perennials, across warm season and cool season, all in the same system. That's complex. This is, this is, this is a hard thing and it's not something that can be isolated. It needs to be studied in context. So here's an example of a crop on our farm uh, where it's a sorghum sedan grass uh, tillage radish uh, soybean mix. So we've got uh, uh, grasses and, and um, um, brassicas and legumes. And you can see this is, this is one of the strategies that we can use is, is mismatching. So that's actually no-tilled into uh, a cool season grass mix at a time when that's starting to decline. So no-tilling in uh, with the understanding that the biological cycle is starting to uh, tail off, uh, and you can see the difference in growth rate in, uh, in the, a second cut hay field just behind it. The, uh, and so this is a reflection of the limiting factor being knowledge and that the tools we use are really a reflection of our understanding of these biological systems. So that no-till drill is less important than our understanding the biological cycle that's taking place underneath this. And so it's a matter of uh, again, having this incredible complexity and diversity from which we can choose from, but what do we choose? And so here's some examples again on our farm. Uh, uh, soybeans mixed with uh, corn intercropping with uh, uh, Austrian winter pea and hairy vetch and, and rye all mixed in together. Peas and oats, tillage radish. Using winter kill in these cover crops to, to reduce energy input so that we can follow these crops. It's how many successions. It's this idea of, uh, of creating an, uh, organic, or, uh, a pulse, essentially a biological pulse from these systems. Can you, they can be essentially at, uh, at rest or we can start to really increase that metabolism by increasing the rate in which these systems are cycling and through the diversity that we're feeding these systems. So here's some other examples where we can use mechanical uh, means when we understand the system. This is a crimper developed by Roller, uh, Rodale Institute to, uh, to exploit the fact that annuals are vulnerable during the time when they're going to flower and put their energy out of the roots and up into the top. Then they can be killed with uh, simply crimping. It's not quite that simple, but we'll generalize. Um, and then no-till in, we're adding biomass, uh, which is a weed suppressing mulch, and feeding uh, the soil at the same time at many tons per acre. So here's an example of using a drill sorghum sedan grass into winter rye. Again, all uh, no-till adding materials, additive agriculture rather than extractive. Uh, just some more, this is hairy vetch into, uh, into a hay sod. This is tillage radish drilled into uh, pre uh, perennial uh, cool season grasses, uh, working on uh, um, extracting uh, nutrients at the, end of the, at, at the end of the season and breaking up surface compaction. This is uh, organic no-till hairy vetch used to uh, fix the nitrogen for the following year of uh, low-till organic corn. 
This is, uh, again, more cover crops. Uh, crimson clover, one of our favorites. And then, of course, mixing animals. So you add animals into this, and it gets even more complex. And then we, and of course, the, as we've heard a lot about, adding the ruminants into that biological mix as well. Uh, we're also adding grains, which we are well derided for grain practices. But we've got, uh, we're able to use uh, clover uh, legumes undersown that are very that uh, when they disturb, don't the, the, they can, you can mismatch again, the, the growing period, so you can still get a good ha harvest. They're doing this a lot in uh, Australia with pasture cropping, um, although they're de using warm season grasses uh, with their uh, grain production, but we're, we're starting to add warm season into our rotation as well. Adding uh, oilseed crops into our mix again in, in the rotation, and we're using uh, a biofuel production on our operation. This is a, a mobile biodiesel processor uh, moduli uh, modular system that uh, we can produce about 250 gallons in an afternoon. Uh, all self-contained, runs on the fuel it makes. So this seems like a fairly complex system, and so this is where we look back to, again, 1750, around the time of the physiocrats. They're looking at how do they document the com complexity of agriculture, and this is from uh, the crowdsourced encyclopedia produced as part of that product of the Enlightenment, uh, and this is uh, uh, 20 million words, WordPress, uh, you know, letterpressed, uh, 17 volumes, uh, one of the most published works of the day. And one of the key parts that they focus on is the documentation of the practices of agriculture. Um, and they go into quite some detail. So this, I just pulled out one, uh, one section uh, of a month's uh, labor associated with the French farm at that time. So if you read through that, you can see the level of activity. And I bring this up because we're scared of complexity. And here we have a system that, if, if I would argue, is precision agriculture and incredibly maintained uh, complex ecosystems um, that they're maintaining and managing. And think now, if they're able to achieve the documentation of these complex systems, the kinds of tools that we have available to, uh, to us today. And so part of what the physiocrats talked about was uh, and imagined was the free exchange of knowledge, which was part of the motivation to publishing these, and imagined, in fact, the, the first and laid the groundwork for the first uh, open source exchange of agricultural information through the concept of what we would now call cooperative extension. Um, open source is essentially a, uh, a, an extension of a lot of those ideals of reducing barriers to knowledge exchange for the better um, and managing complex systems. So uh, it has gained a lot of notoriety lately with some fairly high profile announcements uh, from companies like Tesla who have announced that they will no longer protect their patents. But I'd like to also bring our attention to projects like the Human Genome Project, which said the research that we're producing will be in the public domain. And I would argue that for the betterment of mankind, and I think when we're talking about agricultural research and uh, developing the best possible systems, that if we look at that, that physiocratic tree and that agricultural base, that we all have an interest in the, every farm having access to the best possible information, and every farm being essentially a research farm to develop those best systems. So, Farm Hack is, one of, is an organization that is based on some of these principles and taking some of these tools based on the physiocratic idea of agrarian culture and trying to document and essentially applying a Wikipedia to farm knowledge. Uh, it was uh, f uh, founded about three years ago uh, with a group uh, at MIT with the National Young Farmers Coalition and has quickly grown since then. It's, uh, it is, uh, um, it's a, a catalog of open source tools. People can post to that repository and, uh, and it, it, they're placed into the Creative Commons. So all of the tools, which now number over 200, uh, uh, range from everything from electronic monitoring to uh, cover crop rollers to uh, weeders and so, uh, and it's all user generated content. It's also tied in with events, personal events, the social element that allow for that exchange of knowledge. 
so that not only are the, like as we see seeds cross-pollinate, these ideas and uh, technologies can also cross-pollinate and exchange. So this happens in person, but also online. And so this is a little bit what it looks like. We've had, uh, we have now many thousands of members and hundreds of thousands of folks visiting this with 16,000 hours uh, spent document uh, on the site. And so it's, and most importantly is that it's tied in with this social aspect and building community around what we're eating. Uh, and it's not a new idea yet again. So uh, these agrarian movements have continually come back to this. So in 1918, uh, uh, this, is a, this is an image from the Encyclopedia of Practical Farm Knowledge, uh, which was published by Sears and Roebuck Company and distributed through their catalog. So all, uh, receiving all ideas and information, giving all ideas, information and inspiration, this social element of ex taking knowledge, monitoring it in the field, moving it through the community club and then back and iterating. And it's interesting that they used a heart metaphor because in fact the physiocrats themselves uh, one of the prominent ones was a physician, was the first to, uh, to propose that blood circulated through the body instead of terminating at the limbs, which is precisely, and, and he then applied that to the landscape and agriculture and nutrients, and saying, well, this is the natural metaphor uh, that, is, that continues to circulate through uh, agrarian metaphors. And so we're looking at cross-pollinating these ideas. So an example is that roller crimper which has, uh, uh, was originally in Pennsylvania, moved to Germany uh, and, and New York State and New Hampshire and Quebec and, and uh, France and back. And here's the French version that's adapted to different uh, topographies that's now coming back. This all happened in a matter of uh, a year and a half. So you think about the cycle of innovation that's possible using tools, also not just mechanical, but using biological tools. The same process of understanding these systems can, uh, can apply not just to steel, but also to the biological systems associated with them. But it's, we have tools that we use that are a reflection of our understanding and how we act on the land, but also importantly is agricultural research and development are, are the tools we use to observe our environment to improve the tools that we're producing. And so we also, some of the recent developments have dramatically improved our ability to do that as well. So I'll skip through some of the adaptive management uh, slides, but essentially adaptive management is continuing ongoing inductive research. And, and so we're looking at reducing the complexity through systems understanding. And so these tools, we've gone from governments essentially having uh, required to do, uh, uh, to generate observational uh, data to private companies and satellites to now we have in our pockets almost there are, uh, over two billion uh, smartphones now on the planet distributed around the world uh, with very complex uh, remote sensing devices uh, embedded within them. And that also allows us to really change participation in this research and in our understanding of these natural systems in a way that's really unprecedented in history. Uh, if you think this, that uh, who could ask questions and what it costs to ask those questions can dramatically change when we reduce the cost of asking those questions. And so that's also what open source is about. And so we're, uh, farm, part of FarmHack has been partnering with Public Laboratory, a citizen science organization for environmental monitoring and looking at all the different things that we can actually measure in our backyards. Again, every research, every farm becomes a research farm, every backyard, a laboratory. So some of the projects, again, through open, uh, open source knowledge exchange, uh, text message environmental systems quickly goes to electric fence monitor, water monitoring, uh, automation, water monitoring, more water monitoring. Putting cameras on, now that cameras are so inexpensive and so high resolution, we can now put them on balloons and kites. And that same technology in your smartphone can pilot aircraft. That upper right hand thing is a $100 LiDAR system that's going on my, my plane. The cost, the commercial system, closed source, 60,000. Open source system, off the, you can order right now, 1,300 bucks. So we can go from a computer model 
system and landscape and nutrient cycling to being able to actually transmit. This is a, this is a $50 uh, system. We get 200 acres of Wi-Fi high speed. So we can start to link those systems together to start to, for the first time, really measure these nutrient flows. And that's the key to environmental service marketing, in my view. And we'll just... All f this is all open source software. And I'll come to the, from high resolution down to the plant level. Software to bring it all together, looking at soil health, recommendations, socializing, the decision making process and adaptive management, and collaborating across organizations, common problem statements, and there we have it. So thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. I will be here tomorrow. For those who are interested in what Dorn is talking about with open source farm hack, he will give us a workshop tomorrow. And I would like to introduce one person who has been essential to the process here today. How would you come out, please? But, wait but, wait, there, there's, there's more. Uh, how is a star farm hack? And he is working on creating a system for remote sensing of various parameters across the farm. And check that out from his or her computer. So, tomorrow we start at 9 o'clock. We'll be a little less rushed because we have more flexibility. Um, for now, please take all your stuff out of the alumni lounge. You're welcome to hang out in the halls. And there's the Slater concourse with artwork. And you can hang out there. And down the stairs is the Remus Sculpture Court. And you're welcome to hang out in all those places. But right now, they have to prepare the auditorium for a concert. So thank you very much. And see you in the morning. <laughs>